So we first have to ask Dame Vivian Hunt, how does it feel to be a dame? <laughs> What is that old song, There's Nothing Like a Dame? Yeah. I mean, it is um, with huge humility that just a very thin envelope comes in from the royal household asking you if you'll accept. And particularly- Were you surprised? You knew this was coming. It, it was the shock of my life. You, oh my God. The process is very uh, discreet, entirely confidential, and a function of nomination by your peers. And so, particularly having been um, in the UK for sure a long time at 22 years, but still um, an immigrant, a visitor, a guest in the business and personal world. How many Americans have become dames? Uh, very few, I haven't counted, okay. but very, okay, few, okay. very few. I'm sorry, so anyways, you were saying like it, it, the feeling of it was just? Humility. Humility. Humility that anything that you do, you know, professionally yeah. or personally, or anything that you stand for would be a role model and motivation to others. The second thing is I'm young. You know, most dames I think are, the average age of a dame in the UK I think is somewhere in the 70s or 80s, which is a wonderful oh. age. So <laughs> I, I also see it as a, an accelerant, you know, just give you a platform to do bigger things, particularly on this topic, you know, the engagement of women and other That's um, great. underrepresented groups. Well, congratulations. In we're, no, no, we're, listen. We're very honored to have you here and very proud of you for achieving that. So. Uh, McKinsey, of course, has studied this issue of women's, women in global parity for uh, various iterations for a very long time. Let's start by talking, particularly for this room, um, I'm going to go beyond the gender pay gap and so on and just, just get self-interested here. Women leadership. Um, organizations, as you know, all of us typically start you know, half and half women at the bottom and as you get to the tippy top, uh, they trickle out and mm. when our, we have a ridiculously low percentage of CEOs and, and boards of directors. What is wrong? There are so many things that good companies need to do to get this right. And it's not a function of any one lever or any one trigger to be able to make progress. Uh, I'll make two observations and then we'll talk about what do you do. First is many companies are trying. When you look at the Fortune 100, there's almost no company that hasn't declared gender, more diverse goals, inclusive culture as an active part of their culture. The power, the profit with purpose mm -hmm. uh, signatories and the uh, fantastic cover story that you have. You know, it's very much a topic of today and I do think leaders, and I think male leaders, never mind the female leaders, mean it 100%. They really do want to see more gender parity and more equity throughout the workplace but actually delivering it requires you to make systematic changes. If I said to any of your businesses that you were targeting the wrong customer or the wrong channel or the wrong geography or the wrong engineering talent, you'd change. And so we're finding some companies are not yet focusing on the most important levers. The first is that pyramid, hiring enough women at all different roles that you have the participation rates, tracking it, stretch targets, and managing it like you'd manage your P&L. I can't say it any more simply than that. Secondly is promotion. This room is fantastic in being filled with female leaders, but whether it's the first promotion or the promotion to the executive suite, those are the two most difficult points for women. We had one uh, company in our data set that had lots of uh, Hispanic women, lots of young women, lots of diverse women in their entry level jobs, but literally 5% of them got promoted to that first level one promotion. So one, oh, that's interesting. So first, your first promotion is, is important and, and that's key. And then you get a bunch of promotions and then it's that, at the end, you know, getting that big tippy top promotion. Or the hardest. Or so, hardest. Well, and they're also most correlated with companies that are making progress. So you want women throughout the, the pipeline, absolutely. But that first leadership role, the, which also gets into your headset, doesn't right. it? It gives you the confidence that you can lead at an early age. And you know, once you have a small P&L, you get permission to have a larger one. Once you have a right. large P&L, you then get more responsibility. And then the pivot into the CEO suite or the C-suite is the other real crunch point and is very strongly correlated with higher performance, so that's good. But it means that we really do have to get a head start and break the glass ceiling. Um, it's also correlated with pay. Right, if you look at gender pay gap, the way to really close a gender pay gap is through skills mix and promotion. Um, and you, unless you're promoting more women of diverse skills, you actually can't close your pay gap. And then the final thing I would say, you know, what can companies do? 
is good news for men as well because agile working practices, more flexibility, and a more modular, more agile way of working is needed to have a more flexible workforce. It's needed because of skills automation, it's needed because of the workforce. But women disproportionately benefit. So everyone will, can benefit from more uh, agile working practices, more flexibility. We've seen companies with five, 10, 15% productivity and agility improvements from doing that, but women benefit more because we are less mobile, we tend to be less eligible for skill sets and so forth. So the things around agility, which is about a third of the economic benefit for a company, actually benefits the entire company, men and women. So, so and you, call, you had this great line um, backstage, all time, every time, what do you call it? The culture that we have to get away from? Well, when you, talk about when you talk about an agile culture, women are facing two barriers in particular. One Indra spoke about last night yeah. very uh, succinctly, which is the double burden of domestic responsibilities. And that is, it's just simply true that women have two to four times the amount of domestic responsibilities. Some of them we might choose to keep right. as women and wives in our home, but it does mean we're still doing two jobs. The other double burden is anytime, anywhere and this always on culture right. that frankly men don't like any more than women, but it hurts women more in a world where you're not available to do the retraining from six to seven in the evening. I love how that crystallizes that culture that we all live in right now. Um, so so if you were to say anywhere. what's women's double burden, yeah. in a cultural sense, it's the most important issue is about this double burden of domestic responsibilities, right. and the other double burden is anytime, anywhere. So this is where I push back as a mother who's, uh, you know, I always see myself somewhat as a mommy tracker and that I'm not an inside the building person. I've always chosen, I, I've always had a high profile career, but always kind of made it so that I could be around for my kids. Um, that means I, and you, and you heard um, Indra last night talk about the, the, the difficulties of being a mother. Mm -hmm. And it, it, even if you're not a mother, taking care of your parents or taking care of your, your husband or your partner, I mean, women, you know, women often make, it seems like, just anecdotally, make choices. And, and that also has to be taken into account when we look at the pool of women who are available for C-suite. Does it not? It, it does, but the right environment can also reflect the fact that they know that women disproportionately, but sometimes men, but women disproportionately are facing those choices and make it easier for them to both make them and also return to work in high profile positions. So I'm not trying to pretend that you can have it all or that choices at certain times in your life aren't appropriate or that a flexible working schedule and not in a company is any better or worse than choosing to be a stay at home mom or you know, working in a, in a corporation. But a good company will understand that there may be three or four different models in terms of how a senior executive works. And one of those models might be the right fit for you and another one might be the right fit for me. You can institutionalize those options so that women and men have more choices. And how do you keep the kid from complaining that mommy's traveling but not daddy? Just hold that thought. Okay, we're gonna go to um, uh, Anusha, where are you? Are you here today? So um, we're, we're gonna start with a couple, uh, as we call them, fire starters to get the conversation started. Uh, Anusha Ansari is CEO of the X Prize. You're gonna hear from her on stage in just a little while. She's been in space. She is CEO of the X Prize, which of course uh, honors innovation. She's gonna take us into the future with a couple remarks, just two minutes if you could. Oh, absolutely. Um, with regards to what we're talking about, for too long, uh, everything that has been designed from cars, from uniforms, from computers, from gadgets and tools have been designed to fit a model of a 50 percentile man. And that's why in many areas we have not been represented and it makes it difficult for women to participate. In future, most of our lives will be run by machine learning and AI, and these machine learning and AI systems are using data that is skewed because um, there's not enough data about uh, any part of women's biology uh, or behavior or um, the way our body works when interacting with machines. And unless we do something about it very quickly, the future architects will also architect the world toward a 70 kilogram white male. And that's what we want to avoid. Because at that time, when machines are making decisions inside a unit that you cannot see, 
finding these biases will be that much more difficult. So the time to act is now. And at XPRIZE, we're looking at how can we close this gender uh, data gap mm -hmm. and working in collaboration with many institutions to actually try to collect and try to find this data and make it available so the excuse of we don't have enough data to design things properly can go away. Thank you. That's, that's really great. Um, Gianna Manes, President and CEO of NMAX. Where are you, Gianna? Right here? There you are. So good morning. I was asked to be a fire starter, but I, I have to say, based on this conversation we had yesterday and, and how wonderful it's been, um, what I'm looking forward to this morning is just keeping it going and, and building on it. I've spent my career in the energy sector, and while women in leadership, particularly in the C-suite, is more common today, is simply not common enough. I've had the great fortune, however, of working for people in my career that saw in me potential and put not barriers in my way or in my path, but instead what they did is they provided me meaningful, substantive, material experiences and opportunities to be able to grow that potential. Now we're hearing this morning that there are things that in fact need to be done and can be done, and in fact, it is a business imperative that we tap 100% of, uh, of the talent that we have available to us. So one of the things that I know that women do uniquely well is that we build coalitions and we build community. And in fact, isn't that what an event like today is really all about? Mm -hmm. So my question and my challenge to all of you is this. What are you doing? What are you committing to do or recommitting to continue to do to build community, to make these decisions, and to actually materially advance this path of parity so that we can unleash all of this talent into our organizations and into the world? Great, thank you. And I would um, remind everybody of Indra Nui's words last night. We need, what was it, a giant girls club. <laughs> uh, we need to be supportive of each other. Um, Sage L. Patel, founder and CEO of Sage L, and um, also a former broadcaster. Thank you uh, for this opportunity to uh, share my thoughts. Um, as someone who builds financial wellness programs for, for companies and um, tries to empower uh, women uh, financially as well, uh, parity is something that I think is absolutely crucial. Um, the more that we give women opportunities and close the wage gap, the more financially empowered they are. And the more financially empowered they are, it means that they can vote with their dollars. They can invest in women-led companies. And I think that's really important. Um, in terms of technology um, in the field that I am in, um, I think it's absolutely been incredibly positive. For one, just the fact that we have the internet and we have computers and mobile phones where women nowadays can share their stories and share their experiences about parity is really important because now we have awareness that we never had before. Um, and specifically, you know, there's 1.7 billion women now that have access to mobile phones in low and medium income countries. Um, 1 billion have access to internet, which means that these women that were never um, they were unbanked or unbankable for the first time can actually save money and, um, and actually control their financial future. You know, I spend a lot of time in India and we have these conversations with a woman who's selling fruit on the stand. She can actually put money away, whereas previously she was handing it over to her husband and her in-laws. So I think that's incredibly powerful. And Dame Vivian just talked about the gig economy. Um, and you know, having that flexibility that women have these days because of technology. So that's, that's also incredibly financially empowering. Great, thank you. So um, let's talk about, let's get provocative here. I want you to provoke this audience, Dame Vivian, with, um, about mature economies and the Me Too movement. Um, some would argue that the conversation has got, got, became so explosive that men are unwilling to mentor women. Uh, Lean In did a study showing that women are, or men are three times less likely to mentor. Um, my, I was just telling you my husband who run, runs his own company thinks twice now about taking a, a young woman, you know, responding to her request that they go out to, to a, a drink or dinner or whatever um, for advice. Where are we on that conversation? And let's make it real short and go to the audience. Yeah. Well, 
the, the reality is the fear of backlash is no excuse for not providing good mentorship and sponsorship. I mean, the fire starter point about good mentorships and great opportunities, that's what made the difference in my executive development is still true. But we have to help men do the right thing and feel comfortable. Technology and automation is changing everybody's job. It's requiring reskilling for every single person, one out of four, one out of five, particularly in developed economies, are going to have to restructure or change their role entirely. And that's no different for men, but we need to give them the tools. So if you're concerned about how do I mentor women in the age of Me Too, if you're concerned about closing the door in an interview with a female colleague, if you're not sure you've got the right language or behavior, Companies and managers, if they're equipped, can give you five tips for what excellent sponsorship looks like. And ladies, we all know a coaching session that starts with at a bar at 11 p.m. at night isn't a coaching session. Probably not a good one. Right? Okay. But coffee in the afternoon on a Tuesday will work every time. That works. Raise your hands and join the conversation. Anybody? Um, I, I'd love to hear from you about how companies are dealing with the post Me Too culture inside. What are you finding? Um, a question uh, for you, since you work with a lot of companies, um, the hiring practices today is being relegated to a lot of um, AI systems that goes through a set of criteria to select, especially in technology um, firms and uh, women in technology and engineering positions. These uh, criteria that have been set has been proven that they sort of bias a male um, uh, candidate. How do you overcome biases where the company may say, well, we bought this software and this is, you know, we got 50, um, you know, 60% male uh, resumes and, you know, only small amount of female candidates? Well, the, the most powerful use of technology beyond sort of core efficiencies and processes is about combining you know, artificial intelligence with human judgment. And what we're gonna get specialized in are the cognitive skills and the judgment to use these technologies well. So any company that's relying just the software to screen resumes and hires is taking the lazy way through and they'll get bias in, bias out. Algorithms are no different than people. The second thing is we don't have, as women, any special skills at spotting and managing bias. In, in, in effect, you say, you know, children will continue to have the biases and expectations for us as women, the same thing is true within hiring practices, et cetera. The system has to be debiased. The algorithms, the review, at debate processes, and then adding on judgment at the end. So I don't think we can just say the technology is taking over. Obviously, we've set those programs. We've designed the algorithms. So it's very important that you've got diverse profiles, women and many others in tech, but we also have to check it and redo it. None of us are living or exercising working the same way we were five years ago, why do we expect the algorithms to work the same way? So we can't take the high-tech lazy way out. We have to take the high-tech combined with judgment so that we can really get after bias in our, in our hiring and in our promotion practices. Let me raise a question for everybody um, from personal experience. Why do you think there aren't more women in the C-suite? Anybody have thoughts on that? Patty, you've watched women in this world for yeah. ages, so um, I'll, I'll let her go ahead. Thank you. So when we started the Fortune Most Powerful Women list in 1998, there was one female Fortune 500 CEO. And every, it was Jill Barad, the CEO of Mattel. And now this is, you know, this is not Canada, this is the United States, but Fortune 500, the US, um, Fortune 500, now, it, I mean, it leaped, leapt, uh, like by 10, nine or 10, just this last year. Now there are 36, 36 female Fortune 500 CEOs, including Julie Sweet, newly named CEO of Accenture, Ginny Rometty at IBM, when Indra and Mary Barra at General Motors, and when Indra Nui steps down, you know, that's one, but, you know, we're, Marilyn Houston at Lockheed Martin, some of the biggest companies in America, in the world. So we're making progress. It's pathetic. What is 36% of, uh, 36 out of 500, what, like seven, whatever, 7.5%. And I frankly believe that we will never, 
ever, ever get to 50-50. And the reason I think we'll never get to 50-50 is because women have different priorities than men. And women think about power differently from the way men do. Men tend to think about power vertically and women tend to think about power very horizontally. We want we want power and influence in many parts of our lives. And I don't think it's a bad thing if we don't hit 50-50. I don't know, Dave mm -hmm. Vivian, what you think. But we need women doing other things in the world besides running Fortune 500 companies. So I'm encouraged by 36. And I'm distressed that it's not 136. I don't really think it should be 250. Interesting, provocative. Right over here. Oh, let, let's add, let's bring somebody else in. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, hi, Patty Shugart. Stand up and introduce yourself. Yeah. Good morning, uh, Patty Shugart, RBC Capital Markets. I wanted to go back to the the how is your organization operating and affected post Me Too? Because mm. I will tell you, I'm sitting here with some of my clients and colleagues, and I, I would say Me Too hasn't been particularly relevant in the last, say, five years. Uh, mm -hmm. I work for RBC. Mm -hmm. You know, we just, I wouldn't say that's super relevant. But what I do think is relevant is just the same old, same old, the pipeline issue. And so we, I chair the Women in Capital Markets Advisory Committee or Council as well, made up of senior men and women in the industry, and I think what we've seen from the research that we've done is the engagement factor for women about eight to 10 years after they start their career. So they come in 50-50, they get promoted, they move along, and the study was called Don't Blame It on the Babies because it, it wasn't because they were going off to have babies, but what they were feeling was this decided lack of, in, or experiencing a lack of engagement, and I think they felt like they were, the perception, or maybe real, that they just weren't being given the opportunities to move up and move along. So I'm, I'm interested in, in how you view the engagement and the ability to you know, continue to get its, you know, our, our candidates and women up to the point where they would actually be considered you know, for C-suite. So I, mean, I run a really large business for the capital market side, I run, and I'm on the operating committee for the business, and so that's all been great for me, but there are very few businesses to run in every organization, and you gotta get your women up to that you got to be ready. So I, I just love to hear your views on on that. Because Respond to the two patties. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think we, you never have two patties often in a room. <laughs> Look, if, if we don't aim for parity, for, for our first patty, if we don't aim for parity, we won't even get close. And so if we aim for 50%, or 40%, we might just hit 30. You know, I remember when the 30% Club, which was mm -hmm. founded in the UK, and we were one of the co-founders of the first one, and we debated, is it 30% Club or 50% Club? You know, should we be calling it the 50% Club? And now we need to, I wish we could go back and change the name to 50%. And the reason why is because if we can get to 30%, that's still four plus times seven and a half. Yeah. So big, ambitious, clear, stretch targets that you can see from space are very important, I think, to even get near the neighborhood. The second thing is you see big differences in companies in their middle management and down pipeline. And by that I mean only about 20% of companies in our Women in the Workplace as well as Diversity Matters data set are making progress on gender and other aspects of multivariate diversity. About 60% of them are what we call resting on their laurels or treading water. And that requires you getting into pipeline management and sponsorship right at that level, late 20s, early 30s, so that women who do have a broader range of interests, who may want to choose from a wider range of options and choices, who will have a chapter around care, or two, or three, and you want them to still choose your company. And so you can do something about that systemically. When we implemented like a flexi working take time initiative in our, our office in the UK and now globally at McKinsey, 60% of the participants are men, but it disproportionately helped us retain women. So I just would say do not let your companies or yourself off the hook. You are senior leaders in this room. You do not have to feel any shade, as the kids say, about being the one who raises your finger and say, you know, have we looked at this analytically? Are we following? What is our data telling us? Because the data is pretty clear that it's correlated with higher performance and better outcomes, you know, higher participation of women and diversity more generally. And it's also pretty clear that some companies are moving forward and some companies just aren't. I'd encourage us to be bold. Um, I, let me in, involve some others. Over there, we have a bunch of questions over here. The, oh, I'm sorry, there's a paddle. I'm following the paddle. Hi, Yvonne Wassenaar, CEO of Puppet. Um, two comments. One, I'm going to 
provide a different perspective than Patty on the target, and I think it's, I think we should shoot for over 50%. And I really believe this is deeply important because the power you have as CEO to set the culture of a company, to create a purpose-driven company with profitability, and with all that technology is doing in the world around us, I deeply believe we need more social consciousness in that leadership suite, and there is no position more powerful than the CEO, and there is no place that it's more powerful than the largest companies. So I think we have to aim high, and while women do have to make hard choices, I was not gonna become CEO because I have three young children, and I had John Chambers from Cisco tell me, no, you will, and I will be your wingman, and wow. it's different than you think. That's great. And I think all of us need to realize that there is a role model of what it means to be CEO as a male, as a white male. That does not have to be your job. You can yes, build an amazing great. team and drive great Let's change. pass on the microphone and get as many more people in as we can, if you haven't spoken. Yeah. Hi, my name is Kim Van Bruggen. I'm the CEO for Triathlon Canada. Um, I recently, well, it's almost three years now, uh, came into this industry in terms of sport administration, having been um, an entrepreneur and ran my own uh, company for 20 years as a consultant. And your question was, why aren't there more women CEOs? <laughs> well, after my experience in the last two and a half years, I, I almost feel like I can tell you because maybe we're smart enough to realize that some of this shit isn't worth it. <laughs> but, like, <laughs> That's basic. Like, at the end of the day, I, I've, I've come now, like, I knew I wanted to come in and make a difference in our sport. Um, uh, I believe in 50-50, the women uh, compete for the same amount of prize money as the men. Um, we've got a female leader at the International Triathlon Union. That's fantastic. There were very few CEOs of national federations um, when I joined. There's a few of us now. Mm. I loved um, the sisterhood last night, um, the speaking here last night, and now today I kind of was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> like, where have you guys been the last two years? Yeah. I sort of feel like um, this this alienated or isolated That's feeling right. that you get that that people very uh, blatantly try to ensure that you feel um, doesn't doesn't have to be the way and um, and so I really appreciate what I'm learning here, but also the fact that um, I think as women because our priorities are a bit different. I want to achieve change in the sports system. So I've said to people, I'm going to put up my hand and, you know, if at the end of the day that, like, I get run over because I've put up my hand to say, this isn't right, we need to change the system. This is an old boys club up, down, and sideways. Like, mm. it's amazing how crazy that part of it is. But I say, I'm, I, I say that we're cathedral building. So I might not be here to see the cathedral built, but I'm okay with the fact that I started the conversation and they can't, it, you won't be able to go back. Like once the doors have opened and once this conversation has started um, in our sport uh, world, um, there, won't, there won't be going back. So um, I, I'm, I'm fine to risk if, if that thank you. helps. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're out of time. I know there's a lot of hands up. Um, thank you all. This is a, I consider this a fire starter conversation to carry on um, when we network at our break. But also, uh, I will be overseeing a breakout session about women and money and power. If you want to continue the conversation there, we'll have more time to do that. I consider this also a starter point um, for this club that Indra challenged us to build last night. So Dan great. Vivian, thank you so much. You are such an inspiration and so insightful.